in our previous lessons that initiated us to some temple and port towns in medieval India, we got to know about the coming of the East India companies. From those lessons, we got to understand this very important point that Indian textiles and Indian spices grew very popular across the world during that time. And because of this, traders from different parts of the world were now attracted to India. Simultaneously, traders from various European nations also saw the prospect of economic growth and economic prosperity through trade with India. Now, do you think these European traders restricted themselves to their own nations from where they conducted trade with India? You will be wrong if you assume so because these European nations, some of these European nations to be specific, now formed East India companies. Now, what were these East India companies supposed to do? But before understanding the purpose of these East India companies, let us point out the nations, the European nations to be specific that formed East India companies. Around this time, the English, Dutch and the French formed East India companies. What were these East India companies supposed to do? On this world map, you can locate the countries of England, France and Netherlands and the traders or these countries as a whole formed East India companies to carry out trade with India. Now, these East India companies meant that they wanted to take control of trade that was carried out in the Indian subcontinent. That is to say, the East India companies did not restrict themselves to their own nations. These East India companies now came to India to form their own settlements and in this way they wanted to increase their trade activities in the East. Because the point that we have been trying to establish is that Indian markets, Indian textiles, Indian spices opened up the prospects of great trade and by seeing these prospects the European traders did not want to let go of these which is why they formed East India companies to increase their trade activities in the Indian subcontinent. And at the same time, this also necessarily meant that trade that was carried out in various parts of the Indian subcontinent now went under the control of the East India companies. Because the East India companies, when they came to India, they were very well equipped. They had the power and the resources to take control of the various trade routes, to take control of the various port towns. And in this way, now the control and power or the autonomy of a trade now slowly started passing into the hands of the East India companies. But there were many big traders in the Indian subcontinent as well. Because when we discussed at great length the port towns of Surat or Masulipatnam, we saw that how these port towns were very, very important. And in these important port towns, many big and very wealthy merchants and traders had settled. Now, these wealthy and powerful Indian traders also wanted to keep trade in the Indian subcontinent under their control, which is to say they did not want the control over trade to be passed on to the hands of the East India companies. So, wealthy Indian traders in the likes of Mullah Abdul Ghaffur and Virji Vora, who owned a large number of ships, now tried to compete against the East India companies. But their ships or the ships they owned did not match up to the powerful ships that were owned by the East India companies. Because when the East India companies came to India and the English East India company to be more specific, they had a very elaborate and powerful naval force. And with the help of this powerful naval force, it was very easy for them to defeat these Indian traders because these Indian traders could not match up to the power of the East India companies. So what was the logical repercussion of this? As a result of this, now trade over the Indian subcontinent or control over this trade now went into the hands of the East India companies. And the Indian traders who were previously working as independent traders now invariably became the company's agents. That is to say, the Indian traders failed to put up any worthy resistance.
So the point, to put it simply, would be the Indian traders could not withstand and they faded out in competition. So you can see how conflict and competition now took place among the East India companies or the European traders on the one hand and the Indian traders on the other hand. And it goes without saying that the Indian traders with their limited resources, with their limited power were defeated. Now what was the outcome of this? As in which East India Company now gained supremacy over trade that was conducted in the Indian subcontinent? So it was the English East India Company. So the English now emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the Indian subcontinent. Because with gaining control over trade that was carried out in the Indian subcontinent, the English now became a very powerful commercial power. And with becoming a very powerful commercial force, they also now gained political power. That is to say, by establishing themselves as a major commercial power, the English now went on to controlling India politically. They now established their political rule and political power over the Indian subcontinent. One of the very important points that we have been harping upon all along is that Indian textiles and Indian spices had very steady markets in West Asia and Europe. This is something that we have understood by now. Now the demand for good textiles also gave birth to various independent kinds of crafts. Now which are the crafts that we are referring to in this regard? The demand for textiles led to an expansion of crafts in the likes of spinning, weaving, bleaching and dyeing. So you must understand that all these crafts as in spinning, weaving, bleaching, dyeing together constitute the process of making textile. And with the growth of Indian textiles in the European markets, in the West Asian markets, these crafts now gained independence. These crafts were now expanding in proportion. Now by hearing about the expansion of crafts, you must be thinking that it must have happened in a very positive way. Because along with the demand for textiles, when people or the Indian artisans were able to engage themselves in crafts like spinning, weaving, bleaching and dyeing, they were able to gain profits, they were able to make profits. But we have to take into account the darker side of this as well. The expansion of these crafts mostly happened after the East India companies had firmly settled their grip over the Indian subcontinent. And when the East India companies now came and controlled trade over the Indian subcontinent, the craftspersons and the artisans who were previously working independently now lost their autonomy. They lost their independence. Now let me give you an example so that you can understand this more clearly. Suppose your art and craft teacher asks all the students in the class one day to make a piece of craft. Now you have a design in mind that you are very fond of and you think of replicating that design in your craft. Now consider you go to your school the next day only to find your teacher telling you that you will not be allowed to make your craft with your own design you will have to reproduce the design that has been laid out by your teacher. Will you be happy with this arrangement? Definitely not, because you had a particular design in mind with which you thought you would make your piece of craft. And when your teacher tells you that you will not be allowed to do so, this means a curtailment of your autonomy, of your independence. Now something similar also happened to the craftspersons who were working in the Indian subcontinent around this time. Now the craftspersons were having to work on a system of advances. That is to say, the products that they were supposed to make had already been commissioned by people living in Europe. So in this way the craftspersons lost their independence. They could not make their own designs in the textiles. So they had to reproduce the designs that were supplied by the company agents. 
So the company agents or the traders as a whole now laid down the designs that were supposed to be replicated by the Indian craftspersons, by the Indian artisans. And this meant an end to their independence with regard to the textiles that they made. With the various European countries setting up their East India companies and the rise of new cities, architecture, trade and commerce in the Indian subcontinent now underwent major changes. Now what are the changes that took place around this time in the Indian subcontinent? Now this brings us to a discussion on black towns. Now what were these black towns? The English East India Company, when they established their power, their grip over the Indian subcontinent, they made these black towns in the new cities. Now, who lived in these black towns? In these black towns, the native merchants and artisans were supposed to live. Now, can you tell me why these towns were known as black towns? To understand this etymological origin of black towns, we will have to question the very foundation of British colonial rule in India. Now, to understand the British colonial rule, you will also have to take into account the issue of racism. Now, when the Britishers set up the East India Company in India, they believed that they were carrying out the white man's burden. That is to say, they had come to India to give enlightenment, to give knowledge to the native people. And invariably, the Britishers believed that they belonged to a superior race, which means that the Caucasians were higher up in the hierarchy of races. They believed that they were superior and the native Indians were inferior to them. This is the basic foundation of racism that was prevalent in India with the coming and setting up of the East India companies. Now, when the Britishers set up their East India company, they believed that they were superior to the native people. Now, going by the color of the skin of the native people, which is brown or black, they now demarcated the towns where the native artisans and merchants lived as black towns. So, can you understand how racial discrimination started taking place from this period? Now, where did the white rulers or the colonizers, as you might also call them, leave? The black towns were demarcated as spaces where the native merchants and traders lived. And on the other hand, the white rulers, simply by the virtue of belonging to a superior race, or so they considered, they now occupied the superior residences. Superior residences in the likes of the Fort St. George in Madras and Fort St. William in Calcutta. Now, India had been witness to ruthless racism and atrocities in the next 300 years. And it is only with the independence of India in 1947 that India got to come out of the tyranny of British colonial rule. With this, we come to an end of this series on lessons on towns, traders and craftspersons. Now, we began this chapter by talking about the three types of towns that were there in medieval India. Firstly, we discussed the administrative towns which were the capital cities or the centers of power. Then we came to discussing the temple towns which were places where settlements grew around the temples. Now, these temple towns, apart from being important from a religious perspective, were also the hub of cultural, social and economic activities. And last but not the least, we went on to discussing the port towns. The port towns emerged in India around this time only because trade mostly happened through the seas. So these port towns were places that were alongside the sea and these port towns were places where intense trade activities took place during this period. While we carried on with this chapter, we focused on one temple town in specific and the temple town we discussed was Hampi. And along with that, we also focused on two port towns and those two port towns were Surat and Masulipatnam. A very important point that we established in all these lessons is that Indian textiles and Indian spices were very, very popular and famous around the world during this period, which is why the Indian markets opened up great prospects of trades to traders from different parts of the world.
Now, while we were tracing the trajectories of these different temple and port towns, one common point that we have seen in all these lessons is that with the incoming of the East India companies, these towns faded out of importance because the East India companies now established their own cities, cities in the likes of Calcutta, Bombay and Madras, which became the new centers of commercial and economic activities. And in our last lesson, we also briefly touched upon the establishment of the various East India companies in India and to be specific, the East India companies of the Dutch, the French and the English. From this, we went on to discussing the roots of racism in India and how Indian colonial past has been brimful with racism and racial discrimination. Now today, India is an independent nation where trade is performed in much larger proportions. And these port towns, these temple towns that we have discussed in these lessons now remain as places or rather leave as places that are very fascinating to archaeologists, to scholars, to historians and not just archaeologists and scholars but also to the common visitors. These places now remain living as fascinating places to the explorers. These places now provide us with treat to our eyes and at the same time these are very important and fascinating places of exploration. So with this we wrap up our discussion on this chapter on towns, traders and craftspersons. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.